Hey, I'm really sorry I can't be with you this weekend. Uh, I've gotten sick, and uh, so I won't be with you, but I wanted to bring you a virtual message. So, um, did we have a crazy week? <laughs> Today we're going to talk about this idea of what unites us, and we're continuing our series. It's the third week of gratitude, a life <clears throat> of thankfulness. And so we're going to talk about this idea of uniting together. Listen, we live in a world that's polarized over everything. They are upset about everything. They fight over everything. Twitter has become a minefield for people to fight in. Facebook has become a minefield for people to state their opinions and opposing opinions and literally fight over everything. <clears throat> and so I want to encourage you as Christians, we have lots to unite over, and we're going to look at three main things we can unite over. We're going to talk about faith. We're going to talk about, uh, uh, <laughs> I got to look at my notes. We got to talk about faith. We're going to talk about forgiveness, and then we're going to talk about freedom, how we have freedom in Christ. So what kind of week did you have? If you were down here, if you're watching and you're in church today, you were in the middle of a hurricane, and I've got a couple of illustrations, some things that I never thought I would have. It's funny because I have a neighbor who uh, <clears throat> has listened to some of our stories, and they're a lot less funny now that I'm his neighbor. This week when he had a policeman in his front yard, and we had this tape. I've never seen this tape before. This is a brand new tape I've never seen. Life hazard tape was put up <clears throat> in my yard. I went out after the hurricane, a neighbor came and knocked on the door and said, hey, one of your trees is sparking. And I went out to find that the tree was sparking. So I called uh, um, FPL and FPL sent me to a message, uh, a recording, and it said, uh, what's your problem? And I said, tree sparking. And it said, we're not doing tree trimming right now. And I said, no, no, tree sparking. And it kicked me off their system. So I Called FPL back again to make a long story short. I didn't get anybody, couldn't get anybody. So I finally called 911 as the tree caught on fire. Oh, by the way, I, I have the tree right here. Hang on. So this is the tree. I don't know if you can see the difference there. It actually caught on fire. And I texted my brother-in-law and said, hey, uh, what should I do? And he said, well, eventually it'll burn through the line and uh, uh, the line will fall. And I looked over and I realized I was really close to the line. So I moved out. I put on my hazards and I didn't want anybody. There was water there. I didn't want anybody to walk through it. And my neighbor even came through and I said, we need to get going. About just a minute or two after my neighbor drove on that road, the wire did exactly what my brother-in-law said. It burned through the tree. But first the line, the tree fell and then the line burned through and fell on the ground and energized that puddle made a loud noise, and for a couple seconds, that puddle was energized. I was so glad nobody was in it, and there was a huge explosion, which I'm guessing had something to do with me later finding this in my yard, I guess, when they had to come and redo it. A few hours later, FPL came. Now, here's the whole point of that really long story, which I'm really sorry. Here it is. It's amazing how we take power for granted until we don't have it. <laughs> you know, you don't think much about it, but even if you have a generator, <clears throat> when the power goes out and you go to flick a switch, if you don't have the whole house hooked up, you go to flick a switch and you realize, oh no, I don't have power in these areas. And it's amazing how many people posted when their power came back on. Awesome, how awesome it is. Listen, I think sometimes as believers, the reason we fight so often, the reason we sometimes get <clears throat> in fights about the silliest things is because we don't realize all we've been given. And so today I want to turn the power back on and let you look at three things. And we're going to look at Romans chapter 3 and Acts chapter 2. And you can read these later, but we're going to look at these in the light of gratitude for our unity. So here's three things we're united about. Number one, we're united by faith in Jesus. Romans 3, 22 to 24 says this, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short. And that literally means in the original language, continue to fall short. And by the way, I haven't had to convince anybody that they're a sinner. I actually had somebody tell me one time, I'm good at it. And uh, we know that's true. Fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by grace. Now I'm gonna come back to that word, so hang on just a second. Freely by grace, 
through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Now, this word for grace, a word called charis or charis, some people pronounce it, but charis is what I like to say. And it's this idea of free grace. Here's the deal. Paul is reminding the early church that it doesn't matter if you practiced religious things and you were born a certain way, maybe in a certain culture, maybe there's things that are different, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, you had very different lifestyles. But the truth is, we're all the same when it comes to sin. But as Christians, the good news is when you turn the power back on, we're all the same because we've been given charis. We've been given this grace that is free. Listen, we are born because of Adam and Eve. This is what the Bible tells us. We were born into this idea of original sin. It means that you don't have to teach a child <laughs> to look at you and go towards the plug in the house. And when you say no, they look back at you and reach towards the plug. I remember at least two of my kids did that specific things. You don't have to have them learn how to yell no. They just automatically do it. Sin is natural for us because we have a sin nature. Another thing is natural for us is we tend to want to earn our way to God. There's religion says you've got to earn your way to God. And so we have this tendency to think, well, what do I need to do? What do I need to accomplish? What things need to happen for me to, to get to heaven? And Paul reminds the early church, it's not about these legalistic things. There was a group saying it was all these legalistic things. It's not about those legalistic things. It's faith. And because of your faith, there is charis. There is this grace given to you. In Acts chapter 2, this is what happened when the early church understood that they were in unity. Here's the things that occurred. They devoted themselves, which means they surrendered themselves. They devoted themselves to the apostle teaching, to fellowship, the breaking of bread, and prayer. So they ate together, they were together, they took the Lord's Supper together, and they prayed together. And then it says this, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostle. What happened? In the early church, they became very aware of what they had been given. And so the divisions, whether they were Jew or Gentile, whether they were from certain area, whether they were slaves or free, whether they were in these different classes, those divisions didn't matter why. Because they had charis. They had been given grace. And they were so grateful for grace that they got along with each other. Listen, one of the things is when you are a grateful person, when you recognize what God has done for you, little things don't bother you. Isn't it funny how when we're tired or when we're hungry or when we need a Snickers, we've got a little thing, little things bother us. We can hear somebody chew. We can hear somebody make that clicking noise with their mouth. We can hear those little things and get aggravated by every little thing. But when we recognize what we've been given, what happens? All of a sudden, we have charis. We realize we've been given grace, and what happens? We give grace to others. We allow others to have that freedom. So here's what I want you to do. Number one, the first challenge is learn how to fellowship in faith. Now listen, here's the idea of fellowship. Fellowship means that you relate to one another, you get to know others. And let me tell you something about getting to know others. You get to know them and you find out they aren't perfect. You've probably heard me say this when I'm in a small group and I start a small group, or I'm part of a small group and somebody new comes, they think, oh, the pastor's awesome. And then just a few weeks later, they're thinking, who let him be our pastor? And maybe they're even thinking, hey, maybe people need to realize that this guy doesn't have his act together. Uh, that's part of life. When you get to know anyone, you realize they don't have their act together. Sometimes they're loud. Sometimes they're noisy. Sometimes they're self-centered. I talked to a guy this week who every time I talk to him, you know what he talks about? Himself. Now, he's saying wonderful things, but all he ever talks about is himself all the time. And I could choose to say, wow, I can't believe he does that. Or I can recognize, you know, I sometimes do the same thing. God, help me to give grace and love to them. That's point number one, united by faith in Christ. So learn how to fellowship in faith, recognizing the grace you've been given so that you can give grace. You and I can give grace to the other. Here comes point two. So we talked about this idea that we're united by faith in Jesus. Our second point is we're united by forgiveness. Do you realize you've been forgiven? 
when you see bread, this is Publix finest bread. <laughs> we like the, I think this is five grain, 12 grain. There's lots of grains in here. I don't know what that means. It's just supposed to be better. But this is Publix five grain bread. It's delicious, nice and thin cut and wonderful. One of my favorite stories about forgiveness really kind of shows the character of God. If you've ever been through LaGuardia Airport, it's, it's uh, named after a former <clears throat> mayor of New York. And one of my favorite stories about him was sometimes he would go and sit in as a judge. And so one night in night court, he sat in as a judge and a lady came in and this lady was presented before the bench. As he took over the bench, this lady came in and she had stolen a loaf of bread, an old lady. And so he asked her, why did you steal a loaf of bread? And basically she was hungry. And so he said to her, well, it's, and I think it was like a $5 fine. And this was back when $5 was a lot of money. And he said, that's a $5 fine and you need to pay your fine or go to jail. And then, of course, she was downtrodden and thinking, what am I going to do? I don't have the money, so I guess I'm going to jail. But then he took off his hat and he passed it around the courtroom. And then he said, but I am fining everyone here for living in a city where people have to steal bread in order to eat, where an old woman has to steal bread to eat. And he passed the hat around and he was able out of that collection to pay her fine and she was allowed to go free. That's this whole idea of forgiveness. When you've been given forgiveness, it's so big. Listen to this. In Romans 3, it continues, verse 25 and 26, this powerful chapter, Romans chapter 3. Here it says, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. I'll come back to that word in a minute, atonement. <clears throat> Through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time. Why? So as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. So here's the deal. God is fair. He is just. And so he can't just not punish sin and not say they can just go free. Listen, there was a guy this week that stole billions, at least millions of investors' money. If he's just allowed to go free, there's something in us that says, that's not fair. What about all the people that were hurt? And there's something in us that knows that we need God to be just, to punish sin. But here in this verse, it says that he was a sacrifice of atonement. This is where we get the word propitiation. And this word for atonement here can mean two different things. Number one, it can be the covering on the Ark of the Covenant. And the idea is that it covers up and protects us from God's wrath. The other meaning is that it's a substitute for God's wrath. And there's this huge debate about whether it's substitute or whether it's this covering. And here's the truth. I think it's both. God substitutes Jesus for us, but Jesus is also, just like the blood over the door in Egypt that we talked about a few weeks ago, just like that blood covers us, Jesus covers us. He protects us. Listen, we can fellowship as believers. We can have different beliefs politically. We can have different backgrounds. We can have different food tastes. You ever meet somebody who likes a food that you hate? Maybe you hate sweet potatoes and they love sweet potatoes. Listen, you don't have to fight over sweet potatoes. You got a lot of other food in common. Listen, we don't have to fight over all these temporary things. Why? Because of faith in Jesus. Go back to Romans chapter three. Too many believers are fighting fighting over things that will not make a difference in eternity while not recognizing all of the things that we've been given, this idea that we've been forgiven. Listen, when you recognize you've been forgiven, it's a huge gift. It's a bigger gift than you could ever get. Just a few weeks ago, we took my niece to Disney World. Kristen said, we're paying for everything. We took her there. We took her to dinner. You should have seen all day long. She said, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I don't know if you've ever given somebody something and not only they not appreciate it, but even attack you, but that's happened. I remember there's been times as a pastor that we've helped somebody and done something for people and even been falsely accused. I'll never forget one time our church helped a person that did not have a house to have a house and everything provided. And that very same person turned around and said, you hate me. You don't like me because of who I am and falsely 
accused us. There's something in us that when we're falsely accused, when we help somebody, we're like, fine, I won't help anybody again. But when we recognize that God has given us this propitiation, this covering, this forgiveness, when we recognize that gift, what happens? We become more gracious with other people because we recognize there's no way I could pay it. There's no way that woman could pay for that bread and yet it was given. And here's what happened in the early churches. Acts 2 continues, all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Now, here's the thing. A cult will use this verse in order to get people to do it. But just a few verses later, there's actually a couple that use this same idea to try to manipulate people in the early church, and they died. <laughs> they died trying to deceive other people. So there's a warning in here, too, that this isn't just a carte blanche. Let's share everything in common and take from this person and that person. There's a warning about manipulation, even in this very same passage. But here's what happened in the early church. They realized what they've been given, so they naturally gave to others. Listen, when we understand that when the Bible says that they gave to people in need, what happened? They knew how much they'd been given. They had received forgiveness, so what happened? Then they gave forgiveness, they gave love, they went out of their way to give to other people. Here's the deal. Uh, Fred Rogers years ago said the hardest thing in life is forgiving. Listen, if, if Mr. Rogers had a hard time forgiving, we're going to have a hard time forgiving. But the truth is, it's the hardest thing. But if you and I carry grudges, listen, forgiveness doesn't mean excusing what somebody does. Forgiveness doesn't mean making light of what someone did to you. You can still say that was a wrong thing. Forgiveness doesn't mean letting someone back into your life that hurt you. But what forgiveness does mean is you understand that God forgave you. So what do you do? You forgive others and you give. Remember, the name forgive has the word give. And so you give grace. You give charis to them. Doesn't mean you need to hang around them. Doesn't mean you need to trust them. Doesn't mean you need to belittle or say that what they said wasn't a big deal. But it means that you have to learn how to say, I choose to forgive you because God forgave me. So that's your next challenge. Receive and give forgiveness. Augustine of Hippo said this about living. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. Listen, if we're going to get along with other people, we have to make the big things like forgiveness and faith the big deals. And the other stuff, we need to have grace, that charis, with other people. Let's get on to point three here. So we talked about this idea that I hope you're not going to fall. And we talked about this idea of united. We're united by certain things. We're united, first of all, by faith in Jesus. We're united by forgiveness when we recognize we've been forgiven. And then finally, we're united because we have freedom. When you have freedom in Christ, you understand you're united. Listen, do you know life's not a competition? A few years ago, I was president of Rotary, and they gave me this plaque. It was so excited. And I had to go to try to find it just now. <laughs> it was lost. It's all dusty. It's gotten all messed up. Why? Because nobody cares. <laughs> Do you have little trophies on your counter? Do you have the little, I've gotten rid of almost all of mine. But the funniest trophy I ever got that I got rid of a few years ago was I won a trophy for a giant golf tournament. There were probably four or 500 people in this golf tournament and I got first place. I was so excited I got first place. Now, let me tell you the rest of the story. The reason I got first place is because I was such a bad golfer that I was put on a team with the best golfer. And for whatever reason that day, I had a good golf day. And so I did actually better than I normally did and actually made a few shots that I never make. But because the best golfer playing was par paired with me, my score hardly counted at all. And there were only a couple of shots that I had to make in order to be a winner. Listen, when it comes to Jesus, one of the things we need to recognize is that we are just on his team. It's not about a competition. You're not trying to be better than other Christians. You're not trying to be superior to other Christians because of what Jesus has given to you. <clears throat> because of what he's given to you, you and I understand what we've been given. Listen to what Paul says. Where then is boasting? <laughs> I can't boast about that trophy. I finally got rid of it because I guess I should have kept it for an illustration. But the truth is, I couldn't brag about the trophy because I didn't really earn it. Where then, Paul says, is boasting? Is it excluded because of what law? The law that requires works? No. 
because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Romans 3 continues, Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles too? Yes, of the Gentiles too, since there is only one God, listen, who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through the same faith. Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. And Paul is saying, I understand that we have followed the Old Testament law. We followed it, but it was only to show the Messiah was coming. It was only to show God's power. Even following the law was by faith. Everything was by faith. And Paul says, it's not a competition. It's not whether you did a bunch of laws. It's not whether you were a better Christian than someone else. Why? Because your score doesn't count. You and I get the trophy. We get awards in heaven. Why? Because of what the Savior did. It's not a competition. Listen, look around right now. Take a look around. Look who's next to you, okay? If, by the way, if you're watching this at home and you're sitting by yourself, I guess you could look in the mirror. But the truth is, look at somebody next to you and just say these words. It's not a competition. Now, you didn't have to yell it. <laughs> but it's not a competition. It's absolutely true. We are not in competition with each other. And too many times Christians are divided because we think we're a little worse or we're a little better than someone else. Listen, your score doesn't count. You trust in Jesus and that makes you grateful. What happened to the early church? Acts 2, 46 and 47. Every day they continued to meet together <clears throat> in temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together, listen to this, with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Listen, when Jesus prayed for the early church, he prayed that our love for each other would demonstrate to the world that we're believers. And too often, Christians are fighting over things that are not eternal. They're fighting over little doctrines that aren't a big deal in Scripture, but they're not uniting over the fact that we have faith in Jesus. It's Jesus who we trust. When Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father but through me. We can unite over that. We can unite over forgiveness, understanding I've been forgiven so much so I can give grace, I can give charis to someone else. And then we also unite by freedom because it's not a competition. Praise God together for your freedom. The reason we can sing songs together, no matter whether you have a great voice or a terrible voice, the reason we can raise our hearts as we sing is because the truth is we have been forgiven so much. Listen, when you and I recognize all that we've been given, it's like the story about the little kid who was adopted. And when they came to the house, they went from room to room to room and looked around the house. And then they said to the parent who was now their new parent, they didn't even recognize, they said, okay. And they, the parent said, where do you want to start? And they said, well, I guess I'll start on the floors and then I can do the windows and then I can do... They didn't recognize. No, no, no. You're not called just to serve. You're called to be part of the family. Listen, I understand that people talk about how we're saved to serve and God has given you gifts, but you're not just saved to serve. You're saved because God wanted you to be a part of the family. When you look at the brothers and sisters around you, we are a family together. My hope is that we will unite under these purposes, praising God together, and God will grow our church, not because we have our act together, but because we understand who does. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, right now you can say, Jesus, I want to surrender my life to you. If you want to know what it means to be a Christian, you can talk to Steve or Rodney or someone else that's on the stage after the service and say, I want to give my life to Jesus. And they would love to pray with you and talk to you about what it means to be a Christian. If you're here today and the truth is you're struggling in one of these areas, maybe it's unforgiveness. Maybe you're struggling with feeling like you're in competition. Hey, just confess it to God and make it right. We're going to have our time of offering now. You give what God's put on your heart. You can give on the way out. You can give online. Thanks for coming and thanks for watching today. And I hope to be back with you next week. Thanks.